Welcome everyone to episode 80 of Kowalski Analysis. It's been a minute since I've done a podcast, but I'm very excited for tonight's guest, a man named Richard Cooper from Entrepreneurs in Cars. I'm going to tell you about him in a, a second, but before I do, I just want to uh, have everyone that's watching, whether you're watching the replay or you're watching the live, do me a favor, drop a comment. Let me know that you're here. Say hi, hey, or hello. If it's your first time watching or listening to a podcast or one of my live streams, drop your location in the comments because there's a very good chance that we have other people in your area that I can connect you with that you can start doing life together with. We have about 80 different cities with clusters of members and people are doing social and service events all over the country right now under the city fam name, which is very exciting. Um, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor for this episode, which is Charm City Countdown. And that's the largest all-inclusive charity gala on the East Coast. It's its 14th year. We're at the BWI Airport Hilton Hotel. This is where we do it every year. And this year's theme is One Night in Paris. It's a Parisian fantasy. So leave your wallet at home. This event features everything, including 12 party zones, premium op open bars all night, gourmet dinner buffets, live bands and DJs, a comedy show by Baltimore's own Mickey Coachella, pretty famous comedian, silent disco, party favors, champagne toast, and the largest balloon drop in Baltimore at midnight. So you can get tickets or hotel rooms at charmcitycountdown.com. All right. Awesome. Now for today, tonight's guest, he is none other than Richard Cooper from, uh, and Richard Cooper is an entrepreneur. He's a private equity investor. He's a content creator. He's a best-selling author, a speaker, and a high-performance coach. He's best known for his YouTube channel, Entrepreneurs in Cars, and his best-selling book, The Unplugged Alpha. Richard has over 200 million video views from content that has helped many unplug from lies around relationships, money, and self-care. So with no further ado, let's bring in Mr. Rich Cooper. <laughs> hey rich you there i'm here buddy hey man how are you good where are you at what part of the country toronto toronto i thought i heard you were in canada yeah awesome how's, yeah. It how's it going with all the all the, the lockdowns and mandates so they kind of is that over with now or is that still happening we'll see <laughs> i have a strong suspicion they're going to try to pull another one this winter because you know that's when everything flares up again, typically for the government. Right, right. I heard George, Jordan Peterson, I actually didn't listen to it, but I saw on YouTube that he said he might run for Prime Minister of Canada. Uh, you know what? He'd be a better choice than what we got right now. I'm not the right. biggest fan of Jordan Peterson. I think he does a lot of good things, and I love the way that he debates You know, the woke uh, crazies, but um, some of his advice isn't the greatest. Yeah. I heard your, uh, your, your episode where you kind of broke down his uh series on i don't know what the series was but he was basically you know preaching the uh the benefits of marriage which i definitely want to talk to you about today yeah but, absolutely yeah okay so before we jump into the interview i just like to do this little segment called this or that gives our audience a chance to learn a little bit about you i'm going to basically just ask you five this or that questions that you can rapid fire back to me you ready okay yeah okay Rich and famous or rich and unknown? Rich and unknown. Okay. Lose sleep or skip a meal? Skip a meal. Podcast or audiobook? Audiobook. Education or experience? Experience. Speed or accuracy? Speed. Speed. Okay. Awesome, man. Thank you. Thanks for playing along. So, um, yeah, thanks for joining me. I, I, how I discovered you was, uh, I have a, a group, a Facebook group called the waiting works community. <clears throat> and it's, um, it's people that are waiting to have sex until marriage, predominantly mm -hmm. women, as you can imagine. And someone, one of the women, the members has been following you, I guess, for a while. And she posted one of your videos. that's basically said, uh, why men are disgusted by promiscuous women. Right. Mm -hmm. And I listened to it and I was like, man, I said, I comment. I said, he's not lying. There was a lot of truth in everything that you said. And, um, and then I reposted it, uh, on my personal page after I booked you and got some negative blowback from, uh, some women, of course, um, slut shaming and all that. And, um, yeah, I just thought it would be a really interesting conversation to have you and I on here, um, cause you definitely say some, uh, what you call uncomfortable truths. And, um, I think, you know, hopefully we'll help people, which is really kind of like, I'm like, at the, what I, what I said in response to these people was like, I definitely don't want to slut, slut shame people, but I'm also trying to warn people, 
you know, that there are consequences to actions because when we were young, I don't know how many women have said to me before, like, gosh, I wish I would have read your book when I was 14 years old. Mm -hmm. My book is called why waiting works. And, Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so it's like, how do you, how do you wake people up without making the people that did make those mistakes feel bad about going down that road? So that's, it's kind of a delicate, a delicate line as you can imagine, but I'm I'm hoping that we can get in some good conversation here that'll help people. Yeah, this will be fun. I, um, I'm interested to hear more about your book too. Yeah, definitely. I'd love to tell you about it. So I just want to put a little disclaimer in here for all you ladies. Some of the things that Rich and I are going to talk about are probably going to be sensitive and and you very good chance that you might get your feelings hurt, but I want to challenge you to listen to this episode all the way through, take the meat, leave the bones. It really is going to give you a a deep dive into the way a man's mind works and you can apply these truths to your own life and hopefully so save you some, some pain down the road. So, uh, you know, try not to be offended. So let's just talk about you real quick. Like, how did you get to be, first off, man, I'm really impressed by what you built. I actually was talking to uh, my executive director of the nonprofit. I started City Fam, and I'm like, I want to be like this guy. He's got freaking supplements and you got beard stuff and soap and all these things going on, mm-hmm. you know, to help men become stronger versions of themselves. And, and, and it's, you know, you've done a really good job branding yourself. I'm really, very impressed. But uh, how did you get to be here? Like you, so I know you were divorced. Tell, mm-hmm. tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So um, I was running one of Canada's most successful debt settlement businesses for good 15. I mean, it's still running today. So let's say it's a 20 year old business. Now my brother now runs it. He kind of assumed that we did an earnout buyout and I just got sort of exhausted with the business and wanted to do something else. So the original plan um, with the main YouTube channel entrepreneurs and cars was to sort of mash up Ted talks with top gear. Cause I've always been a fan of hanging around with entrepreneurs and I've always loved fast cars. So I'm like, how do I make those two things marry up and maybe turn that into a business? And, um, I started interviewing friends in their success rides, but then I ran out of friends with cool cars that were willing to do videos, let me drive their cars. So I just kind of started filling in episodes with in between the shows and just sort of talking about business ideas and entrepreneurship and, you know, like just random ideas like how I would use parties to hire people and how that was more profitable and beneficial than putting want ads in the paper. So mm-hmm. stuff like that sort of, you know, is where the channel started. And then one day some guy came along and he said, um, Rich, you should do a video on the kind of women not to date. And I thought, huh, that's interesting. Um, Cause I got a lot of experience with that. And that was around 20, late 2014, maybe like 2015 or so. Now, by that point, I had been through the uh, divorce grinder, um, had lobbied a bill in Ontario Parliament, which was Bill 55, which was slated to really change the way that uh, debt negotiation companies could work. And it basically put the entire industry out of business, except for us, because we figured out a way to pivot um, with a carve out. But there was there was those two things that sort of like shoved me back. And it was like red pilling moments for me with um family law, basically, because I just figured, you know, if you get, you know, if you get divorced, you just untie the knot, you know, you part ways, you set up a custody plan, everything's fine, but it didn't work out that way. Mm. Um, It was a, it was a big shock to the system. It was like a big cold plunge in zero degree water. Um, And then the third event that sort of happened after the lobbying effort sort of went sideways. And I saw that the government doesn't really care about you. They care more about placating to the banks, financial institutions, and the people that uh, make contributions and, and, and sort of big them up. Um, the, the gal I was dating at the time, who was a single mom of two kids, who was my post-divorce girlfriend, uh, betrayed me. You know, there's just a lot of bad stuff that went sideways. She ended up cheating on me. It was, it was a very bad experience dealing with her kids sort of thing. And that was like, like the third and final straw. And that's what sort of pushed me into unplugging from the matrix of comforting lies, as I like to call it. So that, that sort of red pilled me. And that's kind of what got me into the intersexual dynamics and what, you know, women are really driven by and not what we've been told, you know, what they're really driven by sort of thing. So I went deep down this rabbit hole of entering into the manosphere. Uh, I spent a few years there. I now look at that as a mano swamp. I don't think it's a terribly productive place for many guys. Um, went into a deep dive in Evo psych books, read a whole bunch of those. So yeah, there was a good number of years, probably about three or four years that I went through all that stuff. When did you start coaching? How long ago was that? Almost immediately, because people were emailing me and DMing me and asking me for my opinion and questions. And I started using a link that I had set up for my debt business where people could book me for calls on this platform and they would pay by the minute. Um, except I was booked constantly. Like I was doing three, four calls a day, almost daily, um, Mm -hmm. at a very low rate. I think I started the rate around $250 an hour or something like that. But I eventually under the, uh, guidance of my business coach jacked up to 
the rate to where it should have been. And now that calms me down. So I don't have to deal with those as often. I'm not big on like the exchange time for money sort of business model. So, right. I mean, if you're going to do that, you should be charging a much higher rate is, is what my view on it is. But yeah, I did that for quite, quite a bit. I've, I've probably done well over a thousand private consults and I would say maybe well over nine or 10,000 public ones on my YouTube channel because people call in on the live shows. Right. Yeah. That's awesome, man. I really got really impressed by what you built. So yeah, man, a lot of the things you say are really like, you know, common sense. I feel like, you know, it's, it's crazy that it's can be so offensive in these days, you know, like the, it's almost like people are so um, they're so addicted to lies that the truth is just offensive to them. And you talk a lot about, about uncomfortable truths. What are like your top uncomfortable truths? Would you say, do you have like a, a list of, you know, rules? Yeah. Or a lot of the stuff that I say ruffles feathers, but you know, as they, as they always say, a, a bomber only gets flack when it's over the target. So um, at first it was a little bit odd. Like I would spend a lot of time in the comments section, reading them, see, you know, looking at the feedback from people on my videos. Um, and it's always either because it's true and it hurts their feelings mm -hmm. or it's the white knight sort of characters, the guys that want to swoop in to sort of protect the honor of milady. And then they try to attack you as well. Cause they think that it's going to win over the intimacy of the gals that hear that hear or, or see them sort of chime in to support them. Right. Um, but the main things that seem to upset them is when you say promiscuity is bad for women um men and women are different um i mean like i could keep going but those seem to be like the two big ones that really catch them um when you start talking about things like uh, feminism is uh, toxic or it's not great for the gals it really doesn't serve society um that seems to ruffle a lot of feathers another one that i that that women hate a lot and surprisingly well unsurprisingly it's it's always heavily tattooed women but when i say that tattoos are a sign of you know, it's a red flag. Like it's a woman that you generally want to try to avoid. Um, tatted up women's get very upset. They'll, they'll have their entire army of uh, gals and the white knights come in and attack me in comments and stuff like that. Uh, single moms, whenever I tell guys to stay away from single moms and to choose women that don't bring children to the relationship that ticks off single moms or guys that, you know, white knighted for single moms. Those would be the main ones though. So, yeah, I love to dive into the promiscuity is bad for women because, um, you know, that, that was really kind of what introduced me to you is that video. And, um, you know, I, I talk a lot about, about waiting, saving sex for marriage is, is the book. And it's really the whole kind of platform mm -hmm. unintentionally that I, that I landed on, <clears throat> but, you know, women will always say to me, well, I don't want to date a guy that's got a, a past sexual history either. That's disgusting. And I'm thinking, in all honesty, it sounds, it sounds cocky to say, but like most women that i've encountered don't really care they're more worried about the fact that i've made changes you know i'm uh, you know i love jesus and i'm headed in a good direction and i heard you say in that video about um you know when men are more concerned about a woman's past and men are more concerned about uh women are more concerned about a man's future and i correct yeah honestly, i find that to be 100 percent true and women don't like to hear that especially if they have a past but really to me it goes back to the fact of what men and women are controlling in a relationship. So men, a man controls when, if, and when we get married, he's the one that proposes. So he controls the Correct. security. A woman controls if, and when we have sex. So I always phrase it or pose it like this to women. I'm like, imagine if you, you met a man and you fell in love, you got engaged. And then you found out he, that he proposed to every woman that he dated before you. Mm -hmm. How would you feel? Correct. Like, Not that special. Right. I said, well, that's how men feel when you're sleeping with everybody that you dated before them, because mm -hmm. you were giving the way the thing that you were had control over, you were just giving it away. And now I'm supposed to be, you know, not have feelings about that. And yeah, people don't like that. Yeah, it, it really ruffles feathers when you try to explain to, to society that men and women are different, that you know, women don't generally care about a guy's sexual past. They'll they'll look past it if he's a strong provider and a, a virtuous alpha male that, you know, she wants to be with for the rest of her life sort of thing. She looks at the guy as her hypergamous best option. doesn't matter if she, if, he, if he's been with two gals or, or 20 or 200, um, as long as he can provide. But men are success objects, right? So that's why women look at a man's future. But women are beauty objects to men. And it's always been that way. But 
I think with, you know, society today, we've got modern, you know, this modern version of feminism, which is trying to convince society and especially women that men and women are equal, they're the same. And if, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And that's one of the narratives that, that, that just doesn't sit with me. Like I don't roll with that. So, so when I tell them, it's like, you know, there's, there's going to be consequences to your promiscuity. They have a very, very hard time understanding that and they get upset with it. And it's usually the ones that have a promiscuous past, they get very upset with it. Um, but at the same time, it's very difficult to, to, you know, sit down with a 22 year old and say, look, you know, your value to your future husband is going to be your, your, your beauty and the lack of intimacy that you gave away to other men, right? Um, there's no guy out there that has read even a few lines of an Evo psych, a blog, a, a Twitter following, even like a little snippet from like a Joe Rogan interview with one of these Evo psych guys um, that doesn't think for a minute, for a minute that a promiscuous woman that's been with a hundred guys is not disgusting. These women, in my opinion, are disgusting. And I think guys innately are repulsed by women that have been with that many guys, right? You don't want to share a woman with that many guys. Right. And if you're, if you're planning on having children, why would you want to share the womb that's been, you know, used by other guys, right? That's why throughout history, virginity was so valued right. to, to men and society and why they tried to protect it. It's, it's just in recent times that they've lied to women and they've said, go out and have fun guys do it. So you should do it too. Right. And that's why we have the society. And it, it, it really started with hormonal birth control, you know, cause you know, then you could go and have sex without consequences, right? right? Before there was consequences. If you had sex, you could legitimately get pregnant. Uh, now it's like they can prevent that almost completely and very safely 99% of the time. Yeah. Yeah. And then of course, abortion is so readily available. Yeah. And then that's the backup plan, which really isn't a, you know, like a form of birth control. It's, it's just something completely different. Everybody, you know, debates the merits of it, but it's not birth control. Yeah. So it's important for me to mention here, just my, my view, because I, it doesn't make it less wrong in God's eyes. I always been have to say that the, the, you know, sin is sin. There's consequences to sin, but the, the, the consequences for promiscuity play out very differently with men and women. There's plenty of studies to show that the women with the highest divorce rates are the ones with the highest sexual partners. Exactly. The lowest sexual, the lowest divorce rates are the women for 30 years. They are the ones that married with zero to one partner. Hey, Rob Kowalski here. When I first got serious about living intentionally and becoming a better version of myself, I found a major shortage of things to do and people to do them with. And it was the loneliness and boredom that led me to starting City Fam. So I just want to take a moment right now and encourage you to go over and join the City Fam Facebook community. It's a free Facebook group, and in it you'll find purpose driven people from all over the world that want to enjoy life to the fullest. You can search it on Facebook or you can go to www.friendswithbetterbenefits.com and it'll take you right there. While I'm mentioning it, if you're single, searching for real love, love before sex, as I like to say, I want to encourage you to join the Waiting Works community. That's another free Facebook group I put together designed to help people wait well, date well, and ultimately hit the mark in life and love. And you can go to www.reallovewaits.com and I'll see you over there. Now back to the episode. And it, and it goes further than that. Like, like women that have fewer to no partners also have lower instances of, uh, depression, mental disorders, suicide rates, um, you know, they're more successful, they're happier um, in long term relationships, they've got a higher probability of pair bonding to a male in a long term fashion, monogamously. Uh, they're also less likely, you know, if there's conflict in that relationship to say, that's it, I'm out, I'm going to get a divorce, because, you know, like a woman that's done that 50, 100, 200 times before, what's stopping them from doing it 201 times, they've already done it 200 times, they don't care, it's easy for them to get out. So, you have a woman that was a virgin when you met them and got married or have kids, for example, that's a better choice than a woman that's been with the city block. Right. Absolutely. I mean, it is what it is. A guy can redeem any mistakes. So if anybody's out there listening, it's not like, God, you know, you're done and you're never going to find a husband. We're just saying it does present challenges and there are consequences to sin, which is why God tells us not to do it in the first place. So, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, uh, well, actually the pair bonding thing, you know, when you mentioned that I've made a video that went viral called 10 reasons not to have sex before marriage. And, um, one of the reasons that I mentioned in there was, um, you know, sex connects us. 
you know, so during sex, and it's not it's not the same for men and women. There's a, a really interesting TED talk out there by a woman that endorsed my book. Her name is Dawn Masler, and it's called How Your Brain Falls in Love. And she talks about how women release oxytocin when they when they orgasm. Men mm -hmm. do not release oxytocin when we orgasm. We release it when we commit. Mm -hmm. So if you think about that, the perfect time to exchange, man gives his last name, woman gives her body, and the two people cleave together and form a family unit. And that'll get you through all the storms of life. But what happens is for a woman is she gives up the sex, you know, she basically transfers the control because she has a lot of control up until the point where she has sex. If a man is interested in, in her, this is what I try to help women understand, is that you have a lot of control in the relationship up until you have sex. The moment that you have sex, now you're giving it to him because you're going to be bonded to him and he's not bonded to you yet. So what, now she's chasing him around trying to get the commitment and he's not in no rush because he's like, well, you know, he's already getting the milk, right? Why mm -hmm. buy the cow? So th this is what I try to help you know, women understand, but like you said, if you, if you bond to somebody, you know, imagine you get this oxytocin release and you bond to this person and then you pull away and then you do it again with somebody else. And then you pull away and you, and you do that enough times, you're not so sticky anymore. And it becomes like you said, it's just very easy to dip at the first sign of trouble. Correct. So, um, the tattoo thing, that was what I was going to ask about. Why do you think tattoos are a red flag? Look, any woman that is obsessed with drawing all over her body, there's something wrong with her. Uh, I, I've I've never met a woman that's 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 heavily tattooed that didn't have something wrong with her, and that's just not my experience. That's been the experience. Like I have a, a large community with hundreds of men, and beyond that, I've got a public community with hundreds of thousands of of, of followers, and the vast majority of them all agree with that observation. It's it's not me making something up to, uh, you know, paint tatted up women negatively. Um, it's just not common men tattoos are totally different. I mean, I noticed that you've got tats on your arms, but it's a masculine trait, right? Like throughout history, men have tattooed themselves. It's, you know, it's a tribal sort of experience for some, it's a rite of passage for some, it has a lot to do with culture and what they believe in. Um, but tattooing the, the female body hasn't, hasn't been as common as it is in modern times. Um, and it's not that like, it's not that uncommon to see a beautiful woman, covered in tattoos and it's to me that's the same thing as putting bumper stickers all over a lamborghini you just don't do it it shows a lack of taste um men in my experience want debt-free tattoo freed virgins that's what they want right when a woman's tatted up it shows that she's 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 done something with her past that isn't that particularly favorable it's like you know when you climb to the top of mount washington you get that little bumper sticker and you put it on your car this car's climbed the top of mount washington that's what these tattoos look like to most guys you know, it's like this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, because realistically, it's mostly guys, you know, doing the tattoo work on their bodies. Right. And I know several tattoo artists and the vast majority of them have intimate experiences with these women, too, at the same time. Mm. Wow. I never thought about that. I was listening to some of what you're saying about like the, uh, you know, virgins debt free and non tattooed. It's like, you know, if, I know you've done some stuff with Andrew Tate. And um, kind of reminds me of something I heard from him say, where basically men want to be women's portal to the world. Like we want to be the first one to show them the world. We want to take them to the, the place for the first time, the restaurant, the, the, the country or whatever. Right. And there's a lot of truth in that. Like, you know, when, when, when a woman has all this experience, you know, you're, you're not showing her these things for the first time. And as a man, you, you want that. So I, you know, it rang true for me. Um, you ever get, get scared of getting canceled? Not really. I mean, my life's sorted. I'm sure at some point the woke mob's going to try to come out and try to cancel me. I've had people try to get me fired, you know, which I thought was kind of funny because I founded and I am still listed as a CEO of my debt business. And it's like dumb people actually think that they're going to file complaints. It's like my brother answer the phone and be like, you know, he's the CEO here. Right. Um, but you can't really cancel somebody that's anti-fragile, right? Like it, they tried to cancel Tate and he's even bigger than what he was before. Right. right. Most, yeah. you know, when you try to cut out somebody's tongue, all you really do is prove them right. Mm. So I think that we're, I think we're, we could possibly be getting to the end of this. It seems like Elon Musk's, you know, moved to buy Twitter and his move for more open speech and less censorship. Um, it'll be interesting times in the coming years because um, the, the notion that you can cancel somebody to shut them up right. hasn't, hasn't worked very well, has it? No, not at all. You're right about Tate. Yeah, he's bigger. He's bigger than he's ever been. I was thinking about that yesterday. I was watching something, you know, on YouTube of his, and I'm like, if anything, they made him more famous. So, um, 
let you i heard you say something about uh men being disposable where the disposable sex uh mm -hmm. can you elaborate a little bit on that yeah so dr warren farrell wrote a uh book called the myth of male power i don't know if you've read it mm -mm, no i have not it's a good book he you know he spent maybe 20 years advocating for uh feminist groups speaking for feminist organizations i think he was one of the only males ever voted to their board of directors um and he realized over time eventually that it wasn't women that were the oppressed sex um it was actually men that are um you know purported to have power that they don't really have so w one of the takeaways from the book is that men like men are disposable we've always been disposable throughout history you know men die in wars but the funny thing is there was a quote um hillary clinton said something along the lines of and i quoted this in my book the unplugged alpha she said something along the lines of uh you know women have always been the uh the ones bearing the grunt of men dying in war you know as if to say like guys dying horrible deaths from being shelled or shot or, or burned or whatever right. uh was insignificant but because the men die then women suffer um which is an absurd statement so yeah. society has always reinforced you know as long as i've been alive has always reinforced that women are weak and um men aren't and that men oppress and i think the reason for that is that you can't sell women feminism unless they have an oppressor like you have to have a victim mindset to be a feminist and to have a victim mindset you have to have an oppressor so who's the big bad boogeyman it's got to be men right. and you know today the straight white male is a big bad boogeyman um so you know men have always been disposable which is the truth of the matter is but the fact of the matter is, is today most people think that um you know men have privileges that women don't have which is absurd right yeah so let me ask you this can a beta become an alpha were you always an alpha male in your you know by your approximation or did you become uh an alpha over time and then can a beta become an alpha or do they just destined to die that way yeah so um i've identified four archetypes there's the unplugged alpha the uh unplugged beta and then there's a plugged in alpha and the plugged in beta um i didn't really spend much time considering this you know in my past it's just that through business through dealing with my accountant through dealing with my lawyers through through going through entrepreneurs org and sitting in business forums i was always a guy that they always referenced to as the man's man they would say things like you're an alpha male you don't put up with shit garbage whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. and i just never really thought much of it right but firstborns that um had kind of a difficult upbringing which i did like my parents were strict my dad was a royal air force sergeant uh there was no leeway with me right mm -hmm. if if i didn't have the car back by 10 o'clock at 1001 the car phone in my dad's honda accord was ringing i don't know if you remember those old corded car phones from 1989 but it was ringing is like why isn't my car home sort of thing right so you know when you grow up having a bit of a hard life with uh strict boundaries um you set high standards for yourself you want to do more um you know you want to please you know your parents you want to you want to get stuff out of life sort of thing and I've always said that you know uh, the world needs assholes right like it's assholes that get get things done I'm not saying assholes in the sense where you know you hurt people um or that you intentionally go out of your way but you don't give a lot of thought to pleasing or hurting people's feelings which is a big thing you know in today's world like I know that you'll you know you've got the disclaimer at the start of the video uh you know trying not to be offended sort of thing and I never really cared about offending people but when I sort of went through this process of um getting red pilled you know myself and un and unplugging from society's comforting lies that's when I sort of came up with the notion of okay this book that I'm writing which I ended up titling the unplugged alpha that is the most appropriate title for it because when you consume this information and you adopt it and it becomes part of your life you know becomes a fabric of the man that you are you will become the unplugged alpha like you will become that guy um so you can go from you know subscribing to comforting lies to unsubscribing from them and putting yourself first developing a strong masculine frame adopting a lot of the tenets that I talk about um yeah you can certainly become an unplugged alpha but I think most guys struggle with it and they're probably not going to get there because the vast majority of guys I've noticed that watch my content and I start and I started doing this the other day on my podcast whenever I watch it is I now open with a disclaimer and I'll and I'll tell people like look 
if you think the government loves you, if you think that women can never do no harm and that they're sugar and spice and all things nice, this podcast ain't going to be for you, right? Like I'm going to unplug you from these types of comforting lies sort of thing. So most people want to believe those comforting lies because it's easier than, you know, dealing with the truth. It's That's easier cool. to, you know, sleepwalk through life and just go back to sleep than it is dealing with the, the discomforting reality of things. Until it's not, right? And yeah. so it's not easier. And that's really what I see because I have a lot of friends. I consider myself an alpha. I will, you know, for the most part, I've always been in the driver's seat of my relationships, you know, which actually wasn't great because I was bored, <laughs> you know, um, which I think, you know, two people should be equals now. Uh, I mean, meaning like that one can't say goodbye a lot easier than the other because that's going to doom the relationship. But anyway, I see. Yeah, a I would lot. disagree with that. Yeah. Tell me about that. Let's talk about it. I don't think that men and women can be equals in a relationship. There's a reason why there's only one steering wheel and one set of pedals in my McLaren, because there's only one area of the car that's set for the driver. There's a passenger seat. The passenger seat has value as well. Um, I get involved in a lot of motorsports. I was just down in Baja, Mexico, doing some off-road racing um, in some challenge cars. And the navigator has very important roles, extra eyes set on the road. They keep a they're on the radios talking to the other cars. They're looking at the navigation. So you want complementary phrases. You don't want people equal. I don't think men and women are equal. I think that men and women can complement each other once they identify that there's a masculine role and there's a feminine role. Yeah. And a good woman can complement a man's life, right? If he sure. makes the right choice when it comes to you know choosing women. Yeah, I guess where I was going with that, because I believe, you know, what the Bible says that the man is the head of the household, you know, he needs to be the priest of his home. And he needs all, you know, if the decision ultimately comes down to, you know, if there's differing opinions, the man should make the decision. And I think that's what women want. They want to follow. They're going to try to lead. And if you let them, they'll resent you. I heard you talk about that hundred percent true, but I mean, I'm talking about emotionally where I was always in relationships with women that I was a lot less emotionally invested than they were, which caused me, even though I called the shots and, mm. you know, I guess there was a certain level of security there. I was bored. And I was always looking over my shoulder, wondering if I could be happier with the next one. So now it's like, I want somebody that I, I'm as into them as they're into me, I guess is what I meant. Well, you want to, like, you want to choose women that choose you, right? Mm -hmm. You never want to be in a scenario where you've got more interest or you've, or you've invested in that relationship more than she has. Mm -hmm. I mean, to try to look for parity there to say that, you know, like my desire is here and her desire is here. So it's exactly the same. I think you're going to have some difficulty, one, trying to evaluate that and two, maintain that. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, complexities that come around with that. So what I advise to guys is just make sure, and there's an entire chapter about in my book on it on number three, but make sure you deal with women that have genuine burning desire for you. Because if you don't, you could end up being her second choice. You know, to say that you've both got to have the same emotional investment, I think, I think leaves too many, um, spots open like there's too many blind spots in it um because you're never going to have two people that have the same amount of desire in each other and it changes over time you know it's going to increase for one person it's maybe going to go down it's going to increase they might swap places sort of thing yeah. but i think that if you're a guy and you're going to choose a woman if you want to invite a woman in your life especially if you're talking about something like having kids you know getting in a scenario like that is very high risk and low reward for a lot of men in today's environment and it's low risk high reward for women naturally because they're hypergamous and they always almost always marry across and up on the social economic scale so for guys because i talk mostly to guys like 90 percent of my audience is guys um for men it's make sure that you choose women that choose you and that she's got genuine burning desire for you because the last thing you want to be i get a lot of these requests and consults from guys you don't want to be her second choice you don't want to be the guy that's 35 years old that wifed up the 32 year old professional with degrees on her walls um, she's a, a physician, a lawyer, an accountant, whatever like that, but she spent her twenties partying, going to university, running through a lot of guys. And now she's ready to get right with God and settle down. Right. <clears throat> because she's going to generally pick the beta male. She's going to pick the guy that's good enough. He's hopefully just tall enough. He's got just good enough genes, but his future's bright. Cause he's got a good job. He's that engineer. He's got right. that STEM degree. He's making good money. So you definitely don't want to settle for a woman that only sees you as her second, third, fourth choice. You want to be her number one choice. And if you're not her number one choice, I advise guys to move on. Yeah, I, I think it's great advice, actually, what you're saying. And I, after I watched your video, I went up and I made this my, uh, TikTok reel mm -hmm. where I went up to a whiteboard and I, you're probably familiar with this, but 80% of the women are sleeping with 20% of the men right now. Have you Correct. Heard this? Yeah. Right, okay. 
<clears throat> and I was like, you know, women say they don't, they don't want to be slut shame. They don't want to hear that, you know, promiscuity is bad for them, you know, down the road or whatever. But I'm like, think about this. 80% of the women are sleeping with 20% of the men. What does that mean for the 80% of the men? They're not sleeping with anybody. Or if they are, it's the bottom 20%, right? Now, that's going to create problems because the men, they're, they're sleeping with the alphas. I heard you talk about this. They're sleeping with the strong, rich, whatever, athletic men that are in the top 20%. But eventually they do. They want to come get married. So now they're going to come down to the 80%. And those 80% of guys haven't been getting laid for a long time. And right. they... And now they're they're a little resentful because you you ran through all the, these guys up in the twenty percent and they were sleeping with four or five of you at the same time or at, they had to be just for the math to work. Mm -hmm. And now you don't want me to have feelings about that. I'm like, look, I'm not I'm just the messenger. I'm not the one saying it. You know, it's right or wrong. I'm just saying I can see the, the writings on the wall and literally I was drawing it out that it's going to create problems for you. So it's like I could totally see you know like how you know, that, that 80%, like the, of those men that, you know, betas, if you want to call them that, mm -hmm. um, they get, they get screwed over in the long run because they, the women that these 20% are sleeping with are some of the, their, their future wives, obviously they have to be. And they are, yep. this is what I, this is, I did this debate in LA uh, mm -hmm. a couple months ago where I debated this woman that was a had her de doctorate in sex, something, sexual studies or something. And she was a proponent of, <clears throat> of having sex before marriage. And she debated me on, on not NOS debates this big YouTube channel. <clears throat> and I was just breaking it down. I'm like, look, think about it like this. If, if, if I'm sleeping, if I'm in that 20% and I'm sleeping with multiple women, one of, they're not my best. Yes. Maybe one of them is my best. Yes. But the others can't be my best. Yes. And, but they are someone else's best. Yes. That's their, that, that was their best. Yes. Cause I think that's what everyone is really looking for is I want to say my best. Yes. I want to get someone that I don't think I could have done any better with. And that's the person that I, you know, ultimately want to be with. Now, the only way for women to find out if they are really someone's best. Yes. Is to wait until marriage. Because if, it, if you are my best, yes, you not having sex with me, isn't going to scare me off. It will motivate me to man up and marry you, but it's not going to make me leave you because if you're my best, yes, I want, I want it. I want the sex and I want everything that comes with it. Yeah. That's, that's a very difficult um, conversation though, because I mean, they've collected the data on this and it's, it's very low. Like the percentage of women today that are getting involved with a guy on a long-term basis to raise a family uh, that were virgins yeah. it's, it's, it's tiny percentage. I think it's less than 3%. Whereas, you know, back in the forties and fifties, when they first started to collect the data, it was much higher. It was like well over 50%. Yeah. Um, so right. it's like, you know, for guys today, you're going to really struggle to find a gal that hasn't been with guys before you. Um, and I mean, whether it's, it's, it's two or it's 12, the data is pretty much the same. Like as soon as they're not a virgin, um, the chances of them forming a long-term pair bond, having a healthy long-term relationship, not getting divorced, uh, not being depressed, uh, not going on meds and things like that. They all go up dramatically after a couple of guys. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got a very, very small pool to deal with. So if you're a guy looking to find a gal that's like that, you need to be a super high value guy. Mm, yeah. And I'm not saying virgin necessarily either, but I definitely hear what you're saying. I mean, I, I guess, you know, if after a few guys the numbers play out to be the same pretty much, then uh, that that's the ideal. But I, you know, I, I think about, okay, I've heard you mention, you know, multiple times about marriage being a bad proposition for men. Yeah. And I really kind of want to dive into that because I, I feel like and I talked to Elliot Hulse about this where like, not you're correct. And only 3% of the population waits. 97% of people do not wait to have sex until marriage. Women, R women though. A lot of men are virgins even into their thirties still. Right. Okay. I, yeah. that, actually that that's, that's I, the study I read must've been for women. I did not, did not know that, but I guess with the 80% of the, the men not having sex, that would make sense. Um, you know, There's a lot of guys that are in their thirties right now. I think the data says something like 30% of men up to the age of uh, 30 or 33 are not having sex. Yeah. I don't think they're making it to the, the wedding night as virgins though. Cause aren't they sleeping with the girl while they're dating? They might, they might get lucky and get, you know, um, a short-term girlfriend or they might get, you know, one girl, you know, sort of under the belt and have a little bit of experience, but the vast majority of men today are actually sexless. Like they're, they're not having good results with women. They're not even dating. Um, there's a large community of men out there. Um, they're called black pillars, incels. 
Um, and they get yeah. together and they spend a lot of time online. They make a lot of videos. They have discussion forums and they talk about how they were dealt a terrible hand. Their jaw structure is not right. They're not tall enough. Their skin color is wrong. They just sort of like, the, there's a lot of whinging and whining. It's very similar to the victim mindset that feminists use, yeah. except for they're just saying like, you know, it's not fair. And right. why can't <clears throat> women just see me, you know, for what I am? Cause I'm a really nice guy sort of thing. And it's like, well, if you're 300 pounds and living in your mom's basement, playing video games with a neck beard, there's not a lot of women that are going to, you know, want to chase you down, my friend. Yeah. So I, I guess where I wanted to go with that was, you know, like you, I, I, you say marriage is a bad proposition for men. I yeah. definitely think in the, the climate that we're living in, I, you know, there's truth in that. But what I feel like is, is the pro the problem stems from the fact that if people aren't waiting, they're not committed to waiting mm -hmm. men or women. Like, so you were married and you were divorced. Now, did mm -hmm. you have sex before marriage? Of course, yeah. Okay, most people do, right? And and everybody says, you know, you got to take a car for a test drive, right? Everybody, that's the number one argument people give mm -hmm. back to me when I talk about waiting. But I'm like, if that works so well, why is the divorce rate 50% when that's what everybody's doing? You know, so my thought and my belief heavily based on my own experience, and this is really kind of what my book is all about, was I used to be the biggest man whore in Baltimore. I have sex with hundreds of women, hundreds the of biggest women. man whore in Baltimore. I yeah, like I, that. Was, I, was, I was the biggest <laughs> man. I was well known too. Okay. And um, I was a stripper and I was a nightclub promoter and I just had you know, tons of casual sex. And then I became a Christian. I had this radical encounter with Jesus when I was 27. Uh -huh. And selfishly, I believe that if I didn't sin long enough, I knew what I was signing up for when I followed. I mean, I know that, you know, monogamy is basically what I was signing up for. And I was mm -hmm. willing to do it. But I, and I thought, well, if I don't sin long enough, God will give me a wife. I'd never been in love. And I felt like, you know, if I behave myself, he would give me a wife. And I didn't think it was going to be long. And it turned into six years of abstinence. And then I backslid is what they call it. I don't know if you're a Christian, but I basically went out, started having sex again, had a bunch more sex, you know, a bunch more women, mm -hmm. and then rededicated my life. And it, somewhere in there from living at the polar ends of the spectrum, back and forth, I really started to understand, like, why I kept getting into these relationships with these women that were, there was never, it was lackluster. Every relationship mm -hmm. wasn't that great because I wasn't asking myself the hard questions on the front end. So now I, I've been outside of two isolated mistakes. I've been abstaining from sex for 11 years. I imagine it's pretty tough. Um, and I could get sex if I wanted anytime. And, um, but I can look at a woman now and say, is she everything you want? Is she your best? Yes. Before I was having sex on the front, I wasn't thinking about my best. Yes. I was like, she's hot, you mm -hmm. know, take her out. We're going to have sex sooner or later. And then I would end up drifting into relationships with these women, some of them, not all of them, but some of them. And like you said, men complicate their lives and then they justify it. And that's exactly what, you know, I'd be in these lackluster relationships that I would stay in mm -hmm. with, with women that, you know, arguing all the time or lots of problems. And I would stay in these relationships because that's what the biology of the sex does. A woman pair bonds to a man, even if it, even if he's one foot in and one foot out, he might be even sleeping with other women and she's going to, you know, stand by her man. And then the man feels a sense of ownership over the woman doesn't want other guys to bang her, even if he wants other, you know, even if he wants to date or sleep with other women, or even if she's a complete bitch and mm -hmm. people get these soul ties is what they call it in Christianese. And they spend their whole lives with the wrong people. And I believe it all goes back to the fact that you didn't do it God's way. You didn't wait. So now, now this is what you get. Mm. How do you feel about that? Um, yeah, that's interesting. Hey, Rob again here. And I quickly wanted to tell you about City Fam's Rise Goals Conference coming up this January 12th through the 15th in Destin, Florida. And this is an event that we do every year. This is how we start our year. And we really just kind of map out how we want our next 12 months to go. So many of our members don't really know their purpose and we're going to be working with certified life coaches that are going to help pull it out of you and then actually help you reverse engineer a plan to get there. So if you can't attend in person, you can also attend online. I'll put the link in the show notes and I hope to see you in Florida in person or online. I mean, I'm not a religious guy, so I don't subscribe to any um, organized religion. And um, I don't think humans are great at monogamy, you know, if we're being honest. I don't, I don't believe that we were, I mean, evolutionarily speaking, and again, you know, I'm coming at this from a different angle, you know, from you, obviously, but from that perspective, um, we never operated as monogamous pair bonders. We were nomadic uh, hunter gatherers. Uh, there was lots of promiscuous sex. It's kind of always been that way. I think that um, religion can be a good buffer. I mean, if you want to invite a woman in your life, I would say a woman that subscribes to 
a religion that um you know is good for the family household for the household unit for uh children um you know for her pair bonding to you to looking up to you to letting you lead um you know and encouraging the man to lead obviously that can be a good thing um so i'm not opposed to it like my kid goes to a catholic school obviously right so i don't have issues with it but i don't i don't like a lot of the the trad con sort of narratives that uh push guys into marriage blindly i think that you have to open your eyes to the reality of what marriage is you have to recognize that in most places in the west if you get married you are essentially inviting the state into your household um the state is built in such a way that it actually encourages women to get divorced like women are financially incentivized today to leave their families to leave their husband because they will make a lot more money uh from the government as a single mom raising the kids having most of the control raising those kids uh and alienating the father from those kids like there's financial incentives to breaking up the household so I have an entire chapter in my book on why smart men don't marry I don't know if you've read my book yet no I've read the cliff notes yeah okay so it's probably worth checking out I mean you're not going to agree yeah. with all of it obviously but I think you'll get some insight from my perspective especially on things like marriage and you know a few other um ideas in there but I think that if you're going to get married you need to vet women properly um it's not on the table for me like without question I would never get married again right I'm in a long-term relationship I got a great gal you know she's my girlfriend uh you know we've been together for a while we're monogamous um but I would never get married I, I mean if she said if you know if you don't marry me then I'm gonna leave I would just say okay fine bye right <laughs> I would have to be okay with that because I'm not that that guy that would allow the state to govern what happens in my household right um now there's things that you can do to mitigate those risks or minimize them there's states that you can move to that are uh equal or father friendly like Kentucky for example Arizona they're right at the top of the list um you know you can vet for red flags you can make sure she's got a low notch count or no notch count um there's a lot of things that you can do but by the time you do all of those things um you're probably left with less than one or two percent of the female population and then you have to you know consider well okay if in that dating demographic there's only one or two percent of the women you know available to me um how many of them am I actually going to uh be attractive enough to that they're going to see me as their hypergamous best option they're going to see me as their apex alpha male and want to be with me sort of thing so um it's a difficult proposition and even if you layer it with you know protective measures even if you want to get a prenup you know if that's your thing women always reserve the right to change their mind at any given time I've talked to lots of uh guys during my consults because one of the things that I did a lot of coaching on was guys going through the divorce grinder in fact a lot of the data that's in my book comes from many of my consults too and I remember talking to several guys that were like you know she came from a good family the parents were intact the siblings were all intact uh good Christian lives went to church every weekend um you know uh, conservative always voted you know conservative from a red state all of those things ticked off all the boxes but then he's like but then she started working in HR in this woke corporation cut her hair short got fat dyed her hair purple got some weird tattoos and now we're getting divorced and I don't recognize her and she's taking the kids and she won't let me see them and it's like that story didn't happen just once like I like I saw versions of that movie many many times over and over again so one of the things that you have to understand as a guy is if you do invite a woman to your life on a long-term basis and you and you create a family with her she always reserves the right to change her mind at any given time one of the big um demographic categories for guys today are, are these dudes that they are uh they call themselves the passport bros I don't know if you heard about these guys where mm -hmm. they figure that you know western women's minds are polluted with toxic feminism so they're better off getting a gal from Latin America from Asia from Eastern Europe or something like that and they fail to recognize that if you bring a woman from one of those countries to the West, the West will pollute their mind over time, sure. eventually, right? Because everything in media, marketing, advertising, government, it's all about, you know, women are oppressed, men are oppressors, BLM, you know, like you go right down the list of all the stuff. There's rainbow flags and square flags and all these flags everywhere. There's pride months for this and that and the other thing. They're going to start to hear all of these narratives and you're going to have to have really good frame to maintain that long-term relationship and only an unplugged alpha has got great frame right most guys are plugged in beta male so they think that they solved the problem by bringing somebody from another country over but the grim reality of it is they end up getting destroyed 
over time. Yeah. Most of them anyway. Yeah. I definitely heard you talk a lot about the family law and I agree with it. I mean, there's, I even think about like, you know, single moms getting more money from welfare. If they have more kids out of wedlock, like the, there's so many laws that are just completely contrary to what we're trying to accomplish here. And exactly. It's almost like, well, you know, what you're trying to accomplish is different from the agenda that they are trying to, you know, cram down everybody's throat. Like it, like it seems clear to me anyway, that their agenda is the pussification of the West. They don't right. want strong, virtuous males leading the household. They want the government at the head of the household. They want women thinking that they're victims, right? So, you know, when you start to look at all these narratives and you start to dive real deep down the rabbit hole, like you start to realize, well, Ooh, this is a pretty messy environment, right? And, and it's like, I'm kind of the guy now that's more of the enjoy the decline. Like, you know, with my stuff, my my content, my videos, I like to just take a big map and I'll be like, okay, here's all the landmines on the map. So just don't step in them, you know, sort of thing. And you should be good. Yeah. Um, so, so that's how I tend to operate now. It's like, some people say it's doom and gloom. Some people say, well, it's just accepting the world for what it is. And it's just a reality of things. And I kind of lean on the ladder because <laughs> that's my style. Um, but I got a great relationship. My life's amazing. I got amazing friends. Business is great. So, um, you know, I think that my, uh, results at least speak for themselves in that sense. Yeah. You're a realist. I guess where I'm trying to go with it is I'm, I guess I'm trying to get a, an idealist where I'm like, if everybody, and I know this will never happen. But if I could convince everybody to wait, right, and then you got a, a world full of people that are saying their best. Yes, women, they're married. Now, now they're not going to marry as virgins because there are a lot of people yeah. that aren't virgins right now that but they would still stop and they would have to choose their best. Yes. And that would create a, a lot more successful relationship than just drifting into something, you know, when you're. Yeah. And I love that notion. I wish that notion was true. But I mean, like, how do you fight the woke narrative of like the mainstream, like, you know, even in popular culture and music, like when I was a kid, the music that I would listen to was like, you know, Metallica, Kiss, Twisted Sister, Poison, Warrant, you know, Guns N' Roses, like those were cool bands that that had an interesting message. And a lot of it would, you know, if listen to the lyrics, especially in the ballads, like they were a lot of just, you know, love her and she broke your heart and you'll get over her and don't be a suck right. sort of thing. But, you know, today's pop culture is, you know, you get artists like Little Naz who are twerking on the devil. Yeah. And it's just like homosexual, you know, and that's normal, right? Like I can't go somewhere now, a lot of language, you know, we can't use today. The R word, the T word, like all, all these words are now like the initial word, right? Like I was driving the other day and there was a tranny across the road. And I, I still use the term tranny, not transsexual, because to me, tranny is short for transsexual walking across the street. My uh, daughter's in the car. I say, Get a load of the tranny over there. You can't say that. That's not politically correct. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, the, like this is where we are today. This is what school, this and you know, Catholic school, right? You know, this is what society, this is what culture, this is what screens have like taught our our children now, even at these young age. Like, you can't use these words because it's offensive. It's gonna hurt. It's, that's that's weird. Okay, yeah. like that was weird when I was a kid, but today it's like, oh, you have to embrace it. You know, you have to bring it in yeah. your life. You know, they send these. Uh, drag queens to schools and libraries and the public school system to read to small children like that's disgusting yeah but that's just the way that i see things so it's like you know your point like i love the idea like i wish the world was that way but the grim reality of the of the situation is it's 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 not yeah. and it's and it's a weird and dangerous place and i think that you know if you're going to have a family and you want to have kids find the right gal make sure you know make sure you vetted her properly I would get the hell out of an urban center, city center, especially like the left-leaning liberal ones. Get out in the damn country, yeah. you know, grow grow as much of your food as you can. Keep that woke crap away from your kids. Homeschool them, you know, as long as you can. You know, people say, well, homeschool kids are weird. No, kids that go to the public system are a lot weirder than the sure. homeschool kids that I've met. Yeah, it's so good, Rich. Actually, I agree with just about everything that you said. I mean, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Jesus. You know, Jesus said that in the last days that, that right's going to be called wrong and wrong will be called right. And the way that things got have gotten so weird in just a short amount of time. I mean, things were weird before 2020, but just in the last couple of years, I mean, man, it got crazy. And I really feel like, you know, this is, I feel like we're going to see the return of Jesus, you know, the second coming, the rapture, all that's going to happen probably while we're alive. And up until then, it's just going to get crazier and crazier. But, um, you know, I, I listen to you and I listen to guys like Andrew Tate sometimes. And, and you, it's funny because like, you have so many Christian values in the things that you say. You say a lot of things that are really conservative, the biblical values. I think where it starts to go left is like, you know, when people start, start talking about like 
sleeping with multiple women or you're mm. spinning plates as you call it. It's mm. like, so you, you would say to a, a, if you have a daughter, you know, you, you're, you're going to say, Hey, make sure she finds one man. You're not going to recommend that men treat her the way that you're, I'm not saying that you're you're telling men to treat women or you're advocating or maybe you are advocating. No, I think you have to have different conversations with your sons and your daughters, right? Like I think that, you know, your daughter, the conversation needs to be preserve your value. Don't right. don't run around with a lot of guys, you know, your values in your beauty. Right. But, you know, society tells gals today, well, you know, your values in your degree, put off having kids, go get a bunch of them, frame them in mahogany and put them on the wall and climb, climb the corporate ladder. And I can't tell you how many late 30s women, you know, there are you know, that are out there that follow that advice that are having a very, very difficult time finding a guy to form a family with, right? So, I mean, the conversations you have with gals should be different than the ones that you have with your boys. I mean, boys should be told chase excellence, make something out of yourself, right? Like your value is based on who you become, right? Don't worry so much about things like promiscuity because women don't really care about that. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think guys have to have some experience with women. So, it's an odd conversation because you're telling guys have experience with women. You're telling girls don't be experienced, right? It's two different things. And the way society is today anyway, like if you have those conversations with your kids or, you know, the people in your inner circle, your nieces and nephews sort of thing, and they agree with it sort of thing. I think that's good for your family, for your inner circle, because you're not going to save the world. But if you draw a, a perimeter around us and separate us from them, then let let them do whatever they're going to do because you're not going to change that, but control what you can on the inside. And if you can control further out in further concentric rings and bring us clo closer to your values, you know, which are great, then that's a good thing. But um, yeah, to that point, it's like, man, it's, um, you know, it's such a bizarre world that we live in today. Um, I talk to a lot of religious guys. So, you know, it's your point that a lot of stuff that I talk about sort of aligns with God and conservative values and sort of stuff that, yeah, I get it. And a lot of, you know, uh, guys that subscribe to organized religions, uh, it seems more Christianity and Catholicism. I talked to some guys from Islam too, as well. Um, but the churches today seem to be like the biggest beta factories. I mean, you ask gals watching this video right now, like how many strong, virtuous alpha males do you find in the church? And there's almost none. Right. So the problem with churches today is, is they don't go back to the traditional values where it's like, okay, men were at the head of the household, men lead, women follow, you know, sort of narratives like that it's you know you're equal you know well uh, like one of the one of the uh, caricatures that have come out of modern churches today is the notion of chore play right like a lot of guys will complain well my wife doesn't want to have sex with me in fact one of the biggest searches you'll find on google is how do i get my wife to sleep with me you know for married guys and then the churches will tell them well if you do the dishes and you take care of the kids and you clean up you know the, the you know the toy room and all these things and she's going to want to have sex with you but chore play doesn't work women don't actually respond to beta males that are bending over backwards to placate them mm -hmm. right so i think a lot of the basic ideas that are in the original scriptures are probably good right. but we're not having modern uh like churches follow that like now you have modern churches with like lesbian transgender priests you know yeah. telling people they can do whatever they want be as promiscuous as they want and that's the will yeah. of god sort of thing and it's like okay well i've kind of you know i kind of think we've we've like left you know the reservation on this one sure yeah, no, I hear you. I actually did a podcast with a guy. I can't remember who the, who the person I interviewed was, but it was about the feminization of the church. Yeah. And I, I, it's totally true. You know, there's a lot of truth in what you're saying. I think that's really actually what makes me stand out in my niche is, is the fact that people can tell, you know, I'm a, I'm a strong guy. I can get women if I want. It's It goes back to what that Jordan Peterson talked about, an unrestrained power. You mm -hmm. probably heard that in more places than one, but that's really the the, the true show of strength is to have the ability to do something and then to not do it. And that's mm -hmm. really what I see. And, you know, if you look at Jesus, I mean, he, he had people pull the hair out of his beard and spit on him and he could have, you know, just spoke a word probably and, and killed everybody, but he didn't do it for the greater good. How do you feel about that? Because that, you know, like I'm thinking about like someone like you, do you believe in the golden rule? What's the golden rule? Doing others as you'd have them doing to you. Yeah. I mean, that's so just that's, basic karma. Right. So that's basically the root of, of all religions, right? Is the golden rule. And people believe in that, but then they, you know, you're telling your boys to go out and sleep with women and then the women, you know, your daughter, you're saying don't sleep with men. So you're telling Matt, your boys to go out and sleep with somebody else's daughters. So yeah. how do you, how do you, you know, justify that? Well, women are doing it anyway. You know, do you or I, or, or any other, you know, content creators out there that have a very similar message, have any chance of, of stopping women from doing what they're doing anyway? Right. So if you want to figure out the sexual marketplace and understand what women are motivated by, 
the only way that you're going to do that as a guy today, in my opinion, is have some experience with women, mm -hmm. right? Because women are experienced. So <clears throat> it sounds, it sounds awkward to discuss because it's, because it's two different sets of messages, but what you tell the people that, you know, that you love the guidance that you give the people that you care about boys and girls is going to be different than what goes on in the world. But when you see what goes on in the world, you have to respond accordingly. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you, you know, how do you know a good, good gal from a bad girl? Right. It's very difficult. Right. But dating them and having some experience with them is going to offer some clarity. Like part of the reason why you have clarity now, and you may or may not agree with this is because of your past. Sure. Right. Yep. And you're like, whatever, you know, I've, you know, I've been through those experiences, right? And there comes a point in most guys' lives, you know, it doesn't matter if they've been with a bunch of gals or a handful or a whole lot of them, but they start to realize that um, women are pretty much all the same when it comes to intimacy. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's like, what is she like when you're not being intimate? You know, yeah. will she take care of you if you're sick? Because your friends won't, you know, my brothers won't take care of me if I get sick. My yeah. girlfriend does though. Yeah. Right. So it's like women offer a lot more than just sexual intimacy, but I think it's important that, you know, you have these, these difficult conversations on these topics and take a look at the reality of the world for what it is, not what you hope it, it should be. Right. Yeah. I hear you on that. I was thinking about, you know, you talking about, you know, women taking care of you when you're sick. Cause I was really like thinking about, you know, I was super promiscuous. It was fun. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not that I don't miss it now, even, you know, there's, plenty of times where I'm like, man, that'd be nice to just take one home right now. Like mm -hmm. I have those thoughts. And, uh, but at the end of the day, the punchline is, yeah, you, you know, when you get old, you, you want somebody that's actually there that cares for you. I, I was, when I was the most promiscuous, I was very depressed, very lonely because th there was no depth to any of my relationships. It was just all very superficial. And, um, you know, I feel like for men, you know, like you get into a relationship with somebody, if you don't have any experience, um, you know, with faithfulness, really, like for me, I feel like I could be faithful to one woman now because I've had so much practice at, at, uh, you know, not feeding the dog. And mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of times, man, if they're out there spinning plates, sleeping with multiple women, then they meet the one, they can't even stay faithful to their because they have no practice at it. Yeah. But promiscuity doesn't affect men the same way that it does women, right? Like men don't have a problem, you know, like you just said, said it yourself, right? Like I was heavily, you know, promiscuous in my past. They, uh, what do they call you? The whore from Baltimore or something man like whore. that? Man, man whore from Baltimore, right? Yeah. So, so it's like, you know, uh, like that doesn't affect men and you're proof in the pudding for that. Cause you're the kind of guy right now that's been celibate and you know, you're looking for the right gal. You don't care about any more notches. And the truth of the matter is, I mean, if you got your life sorted, you're a strong, virtuous guy, you know, you've got good steady source of income. She's not going to care if you were a club promoter for 2000 strip clubs mm -hmm. and slept with every gal that was there right? Because your life yeah. is sorted today, right? So your past doesn't matter that much. And you've gotten right with it anyway. So promiscuity doesn't really affect men the same way that it does women. And that's, again, you know, it's very, very difficult, because you definitely want to tell your daughters, preserve your value. And you definitely yeah. want to tell your sons, turn yourself into something, your value is based on what you become. It's not, you know, just be a nice guy, or, you know, just be a good friend or any of those things, you have to make something out of yourself if you want to do well with a woman in your life right? Yeah. Or women in your life, depending on how it is that you want to run your life. But at the end of the day, I mean, the main reason why I tell guys to get experience with women and to spin plates, which, you know, all that really means is dating multiple women simultaneously in a non-monogamous fashion. Mm -hmm. Women do that anyway, by nature, you get on any dating app, like the way that, you know, society operates today is you talk to a girl, if she's on a dating app, I guarantee you she's not single. And what I mean by that is she's talking to multiple men. She could be talking to multiple men on the dating app. She could have a situationship in real life, a friends with benefit, or it's complicated. Maybe mm. she's cheating on her boyfriend or husband. I mean, you know, when you dive into the dating apps and you see the reality for what it is, I mean, why would you just date one gal at a time if you're a guy? You know, if you want to get your head squared away on what women are all about mm. and not have uh, like one of the big problems a lot of guys suffer with when it comes to dating women is, is a condition called one-itis. And all it is, is having an unhealthy attachment to one woman. They go and make her, you know, their end all be all. And I'm sure there's guys watching this that are saying, yep, I did that. And there's women watching this going, yep, I hate it when men simp for me like that. They turn into total betas and I don't want anything to do with them. But for a guy to get their head squared away, 
and and really get you know what 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 women respond well to you kind of have to date multiple women to figure that out right so is that bad for society maybe if they're out right. banging them, if they're banging them, because you even say you're basically lowering their value is what we're doing. And I, yeah. I agree. I a hundred percent know that, that, you know, I, I compare it. People say, you know, you want to take a car without uh, buy a car without taking for a test drive. I'm like, but do you want to buy a car that's been test driven a million times? Right. You know, do you want to pay full price for that car? Do you want to, do you want to buy milk that someone test sipped? Before Look, I mean, you? if you want to be virtuous about it, then go and do it with women that have been with a whole, whole bunch of guys. You know, if that's the angle that you want to hang it, hang with and, and don't do it to virgins. You right. Know? Yeah. Uh, but I mean, the chance of you finding virgins in you know today's world after the age of about twenty two is very, very slim. Anyway, you're, I mean, you're talking less than three, like three percent of women. What about born again virgins? Girl, it's been off the market for a year. She hasn't had sex in a year. You believe in that? Bullshit. That's <laughs> that, that's a that's a lie that women make up on dating apps, dude. It's disgusting. Like I like like people forward me their screenshots from dating apps all the time, where it's like, <laughs> you know, check check this one out, and like the caption is. Single mommy of four, currently pregnant, looking for my forever after, lo loves God, you know, got right with God sort of thing. And it's like, I don't care who you've asked for, for for forgiveness with. If you have four children in tow from a bunch of other dudes and you got one in the oven, you're, I am not interested. I can't tell you how little interest I have in that. And when I see it, 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 it physically disgusts me. And it physically disgusts most men when they see stuff like that. So as far as I'm concerned, your past is your past and getting right with anybody looking for apologies, being forgiven for it, whatever, doesn't matter. It's still in your past. Yeah. And I don't think that, that women can get past that guys can get past it. You, you have clearly done it yourself. Um, it's very easy for guys to do because see, there's this notion of an alpha widow. I don't know if you've heard of this before. Yeah, hold on. Right, let me make sure I, I did hear you talk about that. An alpha widow is basically the girl that gets dumped by the alpha, but then she dates a beta, but she really wants to be back with the alpha. Yeah. So like almost every woman, if she's running around with a bunch of guys has been out, has, has been imprinted on by an alpha male. And these women are considered alpha widows. And what they'll do is they'll, is they'll always pine for that one guy from their past, that one guy, they always wonder, mm -hmm. you know, how it, how it could have been. Right. And you know, I'll tell you something like I'll tell you it's story time. I'll tell you a personal story. There was a gal that I dated in my 20s. OK, uh, I don't know, for about a year or something like that. And I clearly alpha widowed her. She's she's married now. She's got a family with two kids. And she randomly hits me up on Facebook via direct message um, recently in the last couple of years. So this is like 20 years later, you yeah. know, 20 plus years later. I loved you so much. I'm really sorry I did these things. I was immature. You know, I often wonder how things might have worked out with us, blah, blah, blah. And I'm looking at her Facebook and I'm like, you've got two children. You've got a successful husband, a nice house. He's got nice cars. You know, you got a nice life. And here you are pining for me. Why? I, I don't know. But that's what an alpha widow is. I mean, she saw something or felt something from her past that she never let go of. So when women have been with a bunch of guys, the chances of, of her being alpha widowed by some dude go up exponentially with every guy that she's been with. And it's not uncommon for women to look at their past and try to, you know, to like reconnect with flings. I'm sure you've heard stories of women that get divorced and they reconnect with their high school uh, crush and they get back together or they try to get back together and make it work out. There's yeah. all these stories out there of this uh, concept that's, that's happened, but there's no real alpha widows with guys. Like, I think when a guy gets over a gal and he has a hard time getting, he has a harder time getting over a, a girl than a girl does getting over a guy, right? Like guys will, guys are like the biggest pussies for sometimes months or even years after a girl dumps him. But once he gets over her, he never thinks about her again. He would never take her back. Right. But a gal, she, you know, she's been alpha widowed that guy's imprinted on her. Right. And that's one of the reasons why I always tell guys, you know, you don't want to be her second choice, choose women that have chosen you, because if you right. get, you know, if you get your hands around an alpha widow and you know, your wife are up and you have a few kids with her, but she starts pining for guys from her past or thinks that, you know, she can do better than you in the marriage. It's not uncommon for these women to untie the knot, take the kids. He watches his wealth flow over to her. And then she runs around with a bunch of other guys exposing her children to all kinds of danger. And you don't even get to see your own kids. Some random dudes get to see your kids more than you do sort of thing. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's really, really important as far as a concept for men getting the best you know, results out of life, not to deal with women that are clearly alpha widowed. Mm. Nice.
yeah, I'm, I can see where you're coming from. I feel like a lot of the stuff with with being an alpha, at least in my what's, I don't know, I guess I didn't necessarily think of myself as an alpha. I just knew I didn't tolerate shit. I didn't put up with shit, and I was never That's afraid a of an alpha male. I was never afraid to go all in and lose it. You know, mm-hmm. so if a girl was not acting the way that I wanted. I was not afraid to lose it. Now there was, I can think of one in particular where I was really scared to lose it, but I still pushed the chips in because I'm like, I'm either going to have her the way that I want her or where this isn't. And, and it takes an incredible amount of backbone to do it. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, I don't know if that's something that can be taught. Cause I've seen guys. It can be like, you can only have that backbone if you have experience for women, you know, with women. So that's why I teach guys to date multiple women simultaneously in a non-monogamous fashion. Cause the only way that you can have the backbone to say no to a terrible gal is if you can identify a terrible gal and know that you have options. Right. Yeah, the options is probably... So it's, you know, it's a weird thing, right? Like, you know, like, how do you balance these weird things, right? Like, it raises a lot of questions, a lot of discussion that you can have around it. Well, I'd say you don't have to have sex with them. You know, I think it's fine to go out with multiple women if you're not sleeping with them, because you are sleeping with someone else's future wife. And then that, you know again, going back to the golden rule, there's consequences. You know, I love what Joe Rogan talked about how we're all connected in some weird way that we maybe don't even realize, mm. you know, like you can't go out and sell drugs and, and do, do bad things to people and, and not come back on you in some way. That's is karma. Like you mentioned. So I feel like even with sex it, there, it plays out in one way or another. I look at myself. I'm 50. I've never been in love never been married, no kids. And those things might've been nice. I'm sure they would have brought me a lot of joy, but it, probably some of it, it goes back to the fact that I was such a player, but you, you know, like 50, you could still have a family if you want. Yeah, to. I hope to. I'm not probably going to date, marry a younger woman because I, I think I might want to have kids. Um, but I, one thing I'll, and we can end on this, um, is that I was talking to Elliot Hall. So I was on his podcast and mm-hmm. he, uh, he asked me about marriage. Cause I was just thinking about you with your girlfriend and you said, you know, I'd never get the state involved and get married again. Mm-hmm. And, um, and he asked me, he's like, well, does it have to be marriage? Can it just be like a solemn oath? Mm-hmm. And I was like, it can be, but here's what marriage does. And this is what it's done for me is if, you know, the Bible says the heart's deceitful above all else, you know, desperately wicked. So our heart will lie to us. It'll tell us things that aren't true in order to give our flesh what it wants. Mm-hmm. The reason that marriage works so well is because I, I'm now going to expose it if it's lying, because I could convince myself that I'm in love with a girl I'm dating just to get some tail. Mm-hmm. But if I go, if she was to say to me, let's just run down to the justice of peace real quick before we sleep together, I'd be like, you know, let me think about this a little bit longer. And that's the point. So like, you know, when Elliot asked me that question, I said to him, I I said, he said, can it be a solemn oath? I mean, I said, the marriage works in the same way. Imagine if you had a daughter and she was dating a a boy and you Mm -hmm. sat the the, the boy down and you said, look, you can, you can sleep with my daughter, but if you decide that you want to leave her and sleep with someone else, I'm going to cut your head off. It would work the same way as marriage because he would be like, ouch, that's going to be painful. And then he's going to make think twice before he just takes that girl's virginity. And Mm -hmm. that's what you want. That's, Mm -hmm. that is why I believe God gave us marriage be so that we didn't marry the wrong people and drift into relationships because our heart tells us even if we believe it even if you can get down with the notion no sex before love which most people when i say they the no sex before marriage is extreme they mm-hmm. say okay i can understand no sex before love sure that makes sense how do you know if you're in love because my thought is you'll marry him now it could again it could be some other form of pain associated with you you know it, it would all work the same but i know that that woman that you're dating she probably would like to have she, whether she tells you she wants to be married or not, she wants some level of security, right? She's she probably really into you. And she all women to be, want to be married. Right. You know, they love that level of security. They love the party. They love the notion around it. It's a fairy tale dream that's been sold to them since since uh, they were little. I mean, like even guys, you know, a lot of guys really do subscribe to the same fairy tale dream. Um, mm-hmm. I like Elliot. You know, I've um, you know I've hung out with him in real life. He's a good dude, um, but his marriage works because he he and his wife subscribe to the same values, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And, you know, to find that as a rarity, and he's been with his wife for a long time too, right? Now, as I understand it, they weren't each other's first. I think they were together and then they split up for a little bit and then they got back together. Um, But he's he's managed to make it work out. Now, keep in mind, like you're talking about Elliot freaking Hulse here, right? Mm -hmm. Strong man, big following, leader of men, you know, uh, like, you know, guys look up to him, want to be him, want, women want to be with him sort, sort of thing. But he's careful about the way that he operates in his life. I don't think he would mind me saying this because, you know, we did this public over dinner, but I was asking him, you know, with the public events and the gals at the events, he said, yeah, you know, it's always a problem because they always hit on you sort of thing. So he says, if I go anywhere, that's why I bring my wife, you know, so they've, they've kind of got checks and balances in place that they both agree on. 
that that work for them. And I mean, like, you know, to the notion of marriage, um, you know, we'll talk about that for a sec before we wrap up if we can, sure. because yeah. um, I read an interesting book a couple of years ago by Stephanie Kuntz. It's called The History of Marriage. And marriage is an interesting concept. It's a very modern phenomenon. It's only been around for a few thousand years. Uh, you know, keep in mind, we've been marching on this earth for millions of years, you know, uh, you know, we've evolved through different sequences of our DNA sort of thing. But, you know, you go back through history, we've been around for a long time, but we've never been married, we never, you know, subscribed to the notion of marriage. The reason why marriage exists today is for two main reasons. It's the acquisition of in-laws. Um, and this is data collected from court records, from personal journals. They, they went back as far as they could go through all this. And it's like, for a very, very long time, you know, we didn't have law enforcement, we didn't have schooling, we didn't have medical care, you know, today we have hospitals, we have the cops, if your neighbor's house is on fire, you can pick up a phone and call the fire department. So back in the day, it was advantageous for them to acquire in laws, you know, especially useful in laws that had skills and resources, and then you sort of blend them up, and you'd have a higher probability of passing down your stuff to your kids, because that was the other component of it is, you know, after agriculture, you had land, you had horse, oxen, goats, chickens, land, you know, that you could pass down to your kids sort of thing. So it made sense to acquire in-laws and do that. And it was never considered marriage at the time, you know, then religion got involved, they called it marriage and you took vows and sort of stuff like that. But for a very long time, for most of it, it, it was never about love. It was never about the word of God. It was never about, you know, vows, solemn vows or any of those things. It was about your family looks good. My family looks good. Let's put those two things together and we'll create something formidable, you know, yeah. sort of thing. So, you know, times are changing and I understand that there's, you know, there's reasons why people subscribe to different narratives and values and everybody's got, you know, their angle and their approach to uh, things. But if you think marriage is the way to go, then do it. But, you know, don't don't sleepwalk into it. Make sure you're unplugged for the matrix. Make sure you don't believe any of the comforting lies that they've sold you. Make sure you mate select an appropriate gal, you know, to invite in your life. Don't don't pick the wrong one. Yeah. <laughs> Cause that that's that's how it goes for most guys, right? You know, they generally pick the wrong one and they got to untie that knot at some point. That gets awfully messy. And it's, you know, it's bad for them, it's bad for the kids, it's not good for her. Yeah. Well, this is why I tell people, I mean, I think it's fine, like you said, to date multiple women, but if you don't sleep with them, you could go, this is the most important decision, or at least one of them that you're going to make in your life. And from what I hear, divorce feels like death. So shouldn't you do everything in your power to not make sure that you don't experience it? Well, I would say make that decision with a clear head. When you're, when you're not having sex, you can evaluate so much clearer, you know, like you, I became in love with the idea of women that I was dating for any length of time, even though I was not in love, I was in love with the idea of them. And that's what made it mm -hmm. hard to split. And that's why I feel like the mistake that most people make, but, um, you, you know, what marriage was in the Bible, right? It was, Explain it. It, it was I've, sex. I've never read like, the Bible. Yeah. It was sex. It was like, you fuck her. She's yours. Okay. You got to take care of her. It tells you if a woman was found to not be a virgin on her wedding night, take her to the door of her father's house and stone her to death. And it said, if a man seduces a woman to have sex with him, that's not his wife. He has to marry her. Mm. So it was right there. It was men have the security, women control the sex. You know, it didn't say... It didn't say kill the man, but, uh, although, you know, again, equally sinful, but it said he has to marry her if, mm -hmm. if he seduced her. And she is, you know, found to not be a virgin on her wedding night to kill her. Now, obviously, didn't, didn't the original scripture also recommend having multiple wives too, though? No, it didn't recommend it. It allowed it, but any man it allowed that, it. That was it. Yeah. yeah. Any, any of the, like the patriarch, all, all the men that they mentioned that had multiple wives, it was always their downfall. You know, if you think about the, Solomon, Abraham, David, all of them, it was always the women that brought them down and caused them a lot of pain. So, you know, the, the New Testament says- Well, that, that hasn't changed much for many guys too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bi the, the Bible says the deacon must be the husband of but, but one wife. That's in the New Testament. But trust me, if it wasn't for that verse, I'd probably go out and try to justify polygamy too. <laughs> Because I can't, I haven't found one that is everything that I want, apparently, or, or I guess I would be married, be married by now, but now the, the Bible, at least the New Testament is pretty clear about just, yeah, you gotta, you gotta choose one. Um, okay. but this has been yeah. great, man. This has been a great conversation. Yeah. It's been a fun chat, man. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. I, I would recommend everybody go check out Rich's book, the unplugged alpha. It's got man, like over 5,000 reviews on Amazon or something crazy. Yeah, five thousand five star uh, reviews. It's actually the best selling book in its category. Like, I mean, if you call it like you know, like a red pill book or an unplugged book, yeah. it's the fastest selling book in its category. There's a reason for it. So, wow. yeah, I invite you guys to check it out. If you want to learn more, go to my website, richcooper.ca. It's got all the links to all my stuff there.
Yeah, you got a community of people that you're doing coaching with. There's a library. It looks like of uh, exclusive videos and things like that. I, I would even recommend because I have a lot, a lot of women in my audience. I'd recommend the women check out the book because it's going to give you a peek behind the curtain and into way mm -hmm. into the way a, a, a man's mind works. Even if um, a lot of the things we don't admit, you know, like we might not like because they're not politically correct, but there's definitely some really good hard truth in there. Uh, so I'd recommend everybody check it out. Um, and then you're on social media too. And what, what's your, your channel there? Your um, yeah. So go to YouTube, probably, uh, the two main channels would be entrepreneurs and cars, which is my first channel. The second one is, uh, the unplugged alpha, which is my podcast channel, which kind of builds on the content that's in the book. I do a podcast every week, Monday night at 8 PM. And I sort of build on the ideas of the book and I'm working on the second book that follows up on it. Awesome. Rich. Well, congratulations to all you're, uh, that you're doing. I appreciate you taking the time to come on with us. Yeah, man. It's been a fun, fun chat. Really appreciate it. Yeah, look forward to staying connected.